good evening uh, friends from india and uh, good morning to uh, friends from the west and uh, i'm happy to have uh, all of you with us today uh, to hear from uh, mr satya kalyana sundaram uh, on the topic of uh, transitioning from uh, a cfo to a ceo uh, briefly uh, i will uh, tell about uh, mr satya uh, he is an mba in finance from the university of hartford in the usa he is also a certified public accountant and certified information systems auditor having received both these certifications while working in the us he is a seasoned professional with over 25 years of progressively expanding experience and he blends a unique combination of strategy finance and operations acumen his work experience spans areas of strategy management mergers and acquisitions and fundraising to name a few uh, satya has been a cfo for many years including roles in india uh, uh, cfo at scientific games uh, us dollar 3 billion company uh, diversified and worldwide gaming it's a diversified and worldwide gaming part gaming company and as also was also the india cfo at uh, texas instruments uh, uh, in semiconductors uh, where he was responsible for enabling their exponential growth in india for revenue and operational capabilities uh, satya started his uh, ceo journey at uh, mobme wireless solutions limited a technology conglomerate that developed multiple business across p2p networks payment gateways at uh, telecom analytics and digital banking solutions he led the fundraise of the group company chili from a host of reputed venture capital firms and helped accrete significant value to shareholders through strategic transactions such as sale of chili to true caller later currently he is a managing director and ceo for south asia at eureka.ai a data sciences company that focuses on providing cutting edge intelligence solutions to institutions worldwide through deeply embedded artificial intelligence and machine learning satya's primary role is to drive the overall business financial and operational strategy for the organization at eureka.ai on all business verticals prior to eureka.ai satya was the india country head and managing director at experion the world's largest information services company he led the experience growth and profitability in india to its best performing years while significantly improving the market share of this company uh, he is distinguished uh, uh, distinguishedly recognized as uh, uh, the board of uh, farming part of the board of advisors at center center of analytical finance at the indian school of business and he also sits on the board of uh, board and advises several startups in india and abroad and is a program mentor to the vedic scholars program for women he was co-chair of the economic affairs panel of cii karnataka for a period of over 2 years and a member of national panels for banking and financial markets at cii india satya was inducted to the cfo institute's league of excellence in 2015 and is a multi year awardee of the institute's top 100 C cfo honor as well uh, we would like to hear from satya on the insights of his uh, on his insights of the journey transitioning from cfo to ceo over to satya thank you arun for the very kind introduction and thank you very much firstly for the opportunity to speak to such a distinguished group of people i always uh, very pleased to meet finance professionals uh, because that's where i got my start and that's where uh, i would say that's where the mind and the heart is uh, my training as well so this is clearly uh, an occasion that i was very happy to join thank you to arun and the feng for the opportunity to speak to you uh, i have a short deck that i would uh, like to share with you and and i'm happy to take questions uh, right after um you confirm uh, if you're able to see my deck yeah that's good okay 
Um, so effectively, what I'd like to do is to give my uh, number of perspectives of uh, this journey and what I believe are uh, certain traits that uh, are required for this jump or move. And, uh, uh, you know, please do treat them as such that these are personal views and these have been gathered over my experience and my learnings. So Arun has already gone through a lot of that. Um, incidentally, Arun and I were part of a couple of CFO conclaves, which is when we got to know each other well and uh, share. I had an opportunity to learn from Arun as well. Um, so I think Arun has done an even better job of this introduction than what I can do, so I'll skip this. So the agenda is really um, simple. It's why I believe the role of the CFO has changed. Um, the role of the CEO, as I see it, uh, and then effectively uh, the key attributes that I believe uh, one needs to be able to develop for the CEO role. Uh, my learning curves, the ones that I had a difficulty or I would say challenges or you know, ones that I focused on my work. And finally, my uh, individual perspectives. So like I said, this is uh, from my personal experience, so please do treat them as such. So firstly, this is a question that I ask folks who are aspiring CEOs or who feel that they want to take the role. Is the CEO role for you? And I'll we'll give it some time. I'll give you an answer to this in a little while. So look at this as the evolution of the CFO. And many of you who are senior financial executives already know this, but it's important that you see it in the before and now context where you were tracking the company's performance. That's what the CFO was asked to do. Whereas now you're driving the organization's value. It's a fundamentally different approach. Uh, you're not looking back, looking ahead, also reviewing performance, but you are more responsible for driving value. A CFO, as most of us know, and most of us have done this, financial tax at regulatory positions at all time points of time, they are now the central repository of the entire organization's data. This is not just financial tax regulatory, this is technology, this is operational, this is commercial, all of those. So in most CFO roles, by the time I had uh, come into my maybe fifth or sixth year as a CFO, it was a given that anything that the CEO did not know in granularity or wanted a clarification, he or she would look only at the CFO, not at anybody else. They would always look at me and say, what do you think? Well, what is this? Where is this? What is this? So whether it was technology, whether it was human resources, whether it was operations, obviously uh, the answer that I gave is for things I knew I would give the answer. For the ones I didn't, I would say, I would check back. But philosophically that shift has happened in that you are the central repository of all organizational data. And we were to assist the CEO and the board in financial decisions before, but now you're actually enabling strategic and operational direction uh, of the board and the organization as a whole. It's again a fundamental difference. The number of board meetings that are, uh, I would say, spent talking with the CFO is actually increasing and because they have a granular view of performance, they have a granular view of company even better than most other people. Uh, technology was a tool for a long time and it is your basis now. It is the lever to accelerate decision-making and to help us differentiate data from noise. So technology has been embraced and in most companies, the technology, the CIO, the CTO, we've noticed and have started reporting or have a dotted line reporting into the CFO as well. So it is a must or a learning that we've had to develop. And finally, 
uh, evaluate potential acquisitions, look at the numbers, give them views on whether this is a good acquisition or not. Two, driving strategic direction, where you're telling the board, you're telling the CEO, this is what we need to think about. This is the direction we want to go. And this is how we need to look at things as well. So this is fundamentally an evolution that has happened over the last five to 10 years. And I think it's transforming even more as I speak. And to expand on this, it's become a function of transformation. And uh, let me explain. A CFO has to have effective communication skills. You're not the chief bean counter anymore. You actually have to speak, you have to communicate, probably have to speak on conference calls to shareholders, to the board, uh, and to the company leadership and the company as well. This interesting point uh, I put in Sundar Pichai, and one of the things that people asked, why did you pick Sundar to be the CEO of Google? This does not just have to do with the CFO role. It is anybody. And when I say voice of reason, it's that whenever they were in a meeting and there would be eight or 10 or 12 of them trying to come to a decision, at the end of the meeting, everyone would say, Sundar, what do you think? And so Sergey and Larry said, well, uh, you just made our choice that much easier because the whole company, the entire leadership is asking him. So be the voice of reason, and usually that will land you a role at the top. You cannot be a CEO without strong operational business decisions that are grounded in a combination of commercial operating financial data in, in addition with intimate knowledge of external events. Uh, the best controls environment enable leaders to focus on growing the company is always a risk mitigation, risk assessment, and all regulatory legal requirements are met. Review at all points of time. So you have to have them at your fingertips. The good CFO, and I've had an opportunity to challenge my board as a CFO, um, where they were evaluating an acquisition. It was what they call, I don't know if they do this today, it's called a reverse merger. I was brought in the, midst of the merger, it was a publicly traded company. I was hired and requested to complete the reverse merger. That was my first assignment. And two weeks after I came and I did the, uh, you know, I looked at the numbers, I did all of this, and I went to the board and said, I recommend that we don't go through with this reverse merger. And basically the chairman and the CEO said, this, we got you to finish this, not to tell us not to do it. I said, I'm going to go ahead and do it if you still insist, but commercially, financially, valuation-wise, this makes very little sense. And maybe because I had just joined the company and they were willing to listen to me, or maybe they actually believed in uh, what the analysis that I gave. And at that time, I was a 33-year-old CFO, 34-year-old CFO, so I was maybe half the age of the chairman. Uh, and they didn't go ahead with it, um, which I was very happy about. The valuation was about 8x more than what I had assessed. And this was, believe it or not, six months before the 2008 financial crisis, right? So six months later, the same company was available from eight times more than I thought, 0.25 times what I thought, right? So we didn't obviously still do it, but just imagine paying uh, $50 million for something and then for it to be available for 200K or something like that, something to that effect. That was the magnitude of difference. So, I looked pretty good for those uh, couple of months uh, after the whole thing tanked, but so our share price tanked too in the, in the 2008 crisis. So we had other problems to fix. But what I offered is that we would uh, do a step-based uh, valuation. So we would do buy it at a certain price 
And if they met some criteria, we would buy higher. So kind of an earn out clause. Obviously the other company was not interested. So I did have an action plan and I did do this. Uh, but it was one of those lucky instances where I was proved uh, right strongly. So, and finally, it's inspiring leadership. I think um, for a CFO to, you know, create a pipeline of talent. Um, I always say the first job that a good leader does is to create more leaders, make yourself redundant. Um, and what it does with people who have self-confidence and who are not insecure is that it offers you the bigger role. Whereas most people are trying to protect the role that they have, I'm usually trying to find my replacement so that I can take the next big role. So somebody who does this uh, is also treated as a potential leader for the top job. That's why I say all of the above also requirements, not just for the CFO to be successful, but the CFO to be a strong candidate for the CEO. This is more what I think is uh, at a personal level. Firstly, develop a vision, uh, determine if you want to be a CEO. Vision gives clarity, vision gives us uh, results and objectives. What do I need to do to get the role? What do I need to do? Do I need to change the industry? Do I need to do this? Do I need to learn? And go after learning. It's, a, it's both formalized and informalized. In most cases, once you've reached a CFO or a senior finance role, you've completed most formal training. But in many companies, they would still send you to an executive program at uh, a business school to obtain certain other skills and take all of that, grasp all of that. Doesn't matter if you're 45, 55, if you want to do what you want to do, you have to do what's required. And then in my case, one of the things that I spent most time on is acquiring soft skills. Uh, I was always reasonably comfortable giving speeches and doing these conferences and all of that outside. But soft skills, talking one-on-one, -on -one, um, and I'll spend some time about that a little later. I, I, I figured that I needed to spend more time on that. And of course, you're not going to get the CEO role one year into your job. Uh, you have to build the experience. You have to know that you built companies, you run operations, created value, you have inspired people, and you overall done a phenomenal job for you to be able to achieve same vision that you created. Um, a quick uh, question and people can put the answer in the chat box. What do you think is the most, uh, the word that I use the most as a CFO? You can put it in the text box or you can say it loud. People want to speak. have a couple compliance risk okay consider no is the word that i so it got so good um that people used to say this if somebody said, look, let's go check with Satya, they would say, no, don't worry about it. The answer is going to be no. So I became that brick wall where the answer was an automatic no. That's I was at one point of time quite proud of it. Uh, but I'll tell you why that's changed a bit. So let's go to the CEO. Who's the CEO? And this is, again, my personal view. He or she is the face of the organization, both internal and external. Regulators, partners, customers, shareholders, employees, both. you are the face. Your vision is the one that everybody looks towards now. It's no longer your vision. Everybody looks at that vision. You are the key architect 
of the organization strategy. And you're also, whether you like it or not, the owner of it. So you have to genuinely spark enthusiasm in accomplishing that strategy. Your primary goal is to maximize long-term value. Contrary to what you may think, the CEO's role is to maximize organizations' wealth. Well, and you want to do it the right way. It's unlocking the potential, adding potential, inorganically, organically, identifying leaders, growing them, creating a strong culture that attracts talent, that creates a you know, environment of inclusiveness, growth, equality, all of those. Just imagine we have, I can throw in 15 attributes and all of those are a yes, right? You have, you are responsible for all of that. And you are the change agent. You have to embrace change. In many cases, you create the change to do all of the above. And the best CEOs I've noticed, I mean, I've tried to emulate, actually make the company better operationally because now before if they were the CFO they were telling no all the time like me but now they have the ability to drive decisions that they otherwise couldn't drive so the best CEOs make the companies operationally better than when they were one level below in whichever role they were. Uh, Indra Nui for those of you who know uh, the CEO of the former CEO of Pepsi, and again from uh, my, my city, Chennai, uh, said this. You know, and they asked her, You wanted the top job, and she was a CFO of Pepsi, for those of you who don't know. She got the CEO, and she said, It's not a job, it's appalling. You have to feel that way. And I read this interview of hers with Nandan Nilekani, I would say around 2009 or 10. And for those of you who uh, want to see it, I think it's available on YouTube. Nandan Nilekani is the uh, founder, one of the founders of Infosys. And it's an absolutely incredible conversation. And it's, I think, available both on video and as transcript. It's mm -hmm. about two CEOs who've changed the world, discussing why they did what they did and how they did it in a very, very conversation way. So this stuck with me. So I used to ask myself, do I have this calling uh, or do I feel it once in a while? And uh, it, it is indeed a calling. So here are attributes that I think uh, have helped and are, in my view, integral. The first and most important thing is your authentic. The greatest gift somebody can explain to you or talk about you is that you are an authentic person. You say what you do, you do what you say, you're truthful, and with that comes integrity. You do the right thing, you expect the right thing. If things go wrong, you approach them the right way to fix it. You don't, you don't reward bad behavior. You ensure that you create an environment of positive execution and performance around you all the time. So authenticity and integrity, first and top, top in my list of things. Um, nothing's gonna beat execution and performance. You could be the most authentic person and if you're doing poorly, they're gonna say, well, you're a nice guy, but thank you, we'll find somebody else. Performance and execution is key. Um, and for those of you who think they cannot go together, they absolutely can go together. They do more cases than not. Uh, and the one thing that made me, one aspect that I worked on in a very big way was my ability to partner. Uh, you don't really need to have a great uh, partnership capability as a CFO. You need to have a great negotiating capability. Negotiation is very different from partnership. Negotiation is getting the best deal out of it. Partnership is making sure both of us win. It's a very different mindset. So I always thought I was a great negotiator and I figured I was a poor partner in my assessment. So I worked on that. So you have to collaborate. 
You have to be able to part. You have to be adaptable. You have to be flexible. In most cases, what you think and know will change. And if you hold your thoughts and views strongly, chances are you're going to get hurt very quickly. So there is a Harvard Business School saying that hold strong thoughts loosely. It's an oxymoron. So, you know, try that. And all of these come from fundamentally three ingrained qualities. One is you're self-aware. You know who you are. You know well about yourself. You are result-oriented. And you're a thinker. You're a learner. So here are the, what I call, you mix them to be able to bring a concoction together. You have to have confidence in yourself. You have to have trust in your capabilities and you have to be able to create trust with people. People should be able to trust you when you say, believe me, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take the company forward. I'm gonna make this change work, et cetera, et cetera, all of this. You have to inspire loyalty. I'll give you, um, an example where I was personally very uh, touched. When I left Experian, and for most of you in the US, uh, Experian is a bigger company in the US than it is in India. Um, it's the world's largest credit bureau. When I decided to leave Experian, I actually left it on a personal reason. I wanted to come back home and take care of my parents. And a lot of my leaders actually said, listen, uh, we don't really want to work for anybody else and uh, we want to find other roles. I obviously advise them against it. And my uh, one of my HR leaders called me four months into my departure. They had a 69% attrition. 70% of the company had left. Right? So they actually did a survey uh, where they said, what do we need to do to reduce attrition? And 15% of the respondents said, bring Satya back. <laughs> so, and she actually shared that screenshot with me. I was very touched. Um, so I'm not saying I'm an example of that, but whenever you inspire loyalty, people will uh, do anything that you put your vision out and it's a huge, huge uh, way to build that trust, build that confidence. That's why I say all these are ingrained together. They have to have confidence in you. You have to have confidence in yourself. They trust you, you trust them. They see your passion, you see their passion. This is the result of that. So the word I use most is CEO. Let's give some, uh, Let's see what people have to say. I can't see the chat. Maybe our room can. Because uh, if I click on the chat, then. Uh, Somebody wrote believe. Uh, we have great idea. Somebody asked why. Okay. I'll take it maybe is, one. we can. Let me we listen. Can. <laughs> Hi. Um, so the word I use the most is uh, maybe because once you're the CEO everybody in the company has an idea that's going to change the world and everybody is going to bring you that idea I'm going to have rockets drop milk to everybody's houses I'm going to do this. I'm going to, we can change this. This is how we, we sell this. We open in China. We'll start in uh, Bali. Let's do this in Australia. Let's go here. All, all of these ideas. So, and many of them are good ideas, which I have taken. But um, the answer that I use, and this irritates most of the, the CFOs that I work with, because I tell them maybe, and the CFOs are usually looking for yes and no, which is what I was looking for when I was a CFO. So I usually tell them, don't get worried. Uh, I was getting the same answer from uh, my CEO, so get used to it. So 
Jeff Bezos made this comment, which I thought was interesting, and I tried to imbibe it. You have to become comfortable using incomplete information to take decisions. If you're expecting to have all the data, chances are somebody's already made the decision and moved ahead before you. So the average estimate that I put together is that if I have between 60 and 70% of the info that I need to make a decision, I'll take it. The rest is my gut. I will take my decision to the board. I will take my view to the board and say, this is what I think is what I do. But 60 to 70 percent threshold is what I think is uh, good enough for me. And obviously, Jeff Bezos does can do with a lot lesser, uh, but that's my comfort level. That's where I think. Um, embracing change is obviously difficult. Not embracing it is fatal. You will have to drive change as the CEO, whether you like it or not. Because guess what? It's already started. The change has already started with your appointment. So whether you like it or not, you are a change agent. So please embrace it. Do not take the role and keep status quo. You don't have to go and turn around, you know, throw everything upside down. But you are the change agent. So you have to make things better and better and better. So there is some change that will happen that has started with your appointment. And this is just a change leadership checklist that I use. Uh, I will share this with you later. My toughest and my biggest challenge. Uh, how do I balance this? Intelligence versus emotion. So I had a challenge because the human resources leadership, uh, whether you like it or not, uh, technically the arc enemies of the finance leadership because this is all money and that's all people. And usually we don't want to spend money and they want to spend money. That's how it, it is viewed. It's never like that. So as a CEO, you have the role of balancing the intelligence and emotional portion of, of the organization and more so about yourself. So I've spent, I would say most of my time uh, learning to be a little bit more uh, empathetic, to be able to understand, be able to identify with people's requests, identify with people's situation. And I think um, the biggest and the best, uh, you know, there's a GE saying, never waste a crisis. The biggest, biggest learning crisis for any CEO when it come, comes to emotional intelligence was what we had two or three years ago. COVID put everybody on the brink, right? So do we want to grow the business or do we want to make sure our employees are healthy and alive? The simple answer, made sure everybody was provided the utmost care. Uh, we actually went out of our way and experience to ensure that their families were supported. People who couldn't travel, we ensured supplies were reached. We ensured hospitalization, all of those. And it really, those first three, four months were spent talking only about how to make sure our employees are not just happy, they're relieved that they're being taken care of, or their families are being taken care of. There are a lot of people who are away from their families, who had old parents, who are away from their spouses and who got stuck, who couldn't travel back, uh, and who are actually down with COVID. Um, and I think it put the emotional caution way high up. And I, I felt that that was a fantastic ground to test the leadership. And a lot of us actually realized uh, the kind of leaders that we didn't want. I did find some leaders who were calling people about quarter close and achieving numbers. And I had to give them a view on what's important in life, uh, what's, what, what matters. So. It's important for you to manage this. Uh, and I would say, err on the side of EQ. You've already become a high level CFO. So chances are your IQ is pretty good. 
uh, go heavy on the EQ. Be more empathetic. Be more personable. Be more reachable. And guess what? You will have better success as a CEO. And I'm, I'm giving you all the good parts. And here's the here's the not so good parts. Uh, the board. The board is usually filled with people who've been a CEO for many years and who've decided to take leadership roles on the board. So the first thing that you hear or I heard was whatever you've done, buddy, I've done it 10 times bigger than you. Okay. So don't tell me to look at this this way or that. I've done it. I'm the one who appointed you. So I've done, you've done a hundred million deal. I've done a billion dollar deal. Okay. So I know what I'm doing. So you have to manage that. Um, but they're incredible sources of learning. They're incredible mentors. And if you're able to understand that relationship and work that you will get unbelievable results. The board was the driving force in a lot of my success. So I always felt that when somebody said that they had done bigger things, I would like, please tell me. And I, I went in with that. Please teach me how to think. Please teach me how to do these deals. Um, in most cases, you've got the CEO role over a bunch of people. So they're not going to be happy. <laughs> They're going to try and influence both the employees, vendors, partners. Uh, you can do two things. One is obviously you can take them out. The second is to actually win them over, which is the more difficult one. I've done both. I've had about four or five, I would say, challenges to the role. Um, I was able to win three of them over and I had to exit two of them. Right? So, was a 60% success rate, as I would say. If, in case you're a, you have shareholders, it's not easy anymore. They can actually vote you out if they get enough votes. They will go to great lengths to evaluate every single purchase you've done, uh, the use of the company car, why you bought that, why you have an office in this building, why are you paying these rents? What are you doing? Everything. So be prepared to answer tough questions from shareholders. If you happen to be a company that has venture capital partners or private equity partners, guess what? It's 10 times worse. They're going to ask you questions even more directly and even more. They're not going to sugarcoat anything. Right? So be, get used to that. Um, it's not, they're not going against you personally, but is questioning your decisions. You have to be able to defend your decisions. Your every step is watched with Hawkeye position, right? So when you talk to some celebrities, they say, well, I, all of this is good, but you know, I can't even go to the restroom without being followed. You know, it's not as bad, but guess what? You have two people sitting in your room, those two people are going to get approached. What did he tell you right after that meeting? So every move of yours is going to get watched. And then guess the last one, which I took uh, a lot of personal, I wouldn't say baggage, but a lot of uh, weight with, was the organization's entire emotional portion is on you. Just imagine you have a fire um, or you have a corporate governance issue. Or you have you have to do layoffs. Uh, many people will be part of that decision, and many people will help you execute it. But the one who will feel the most emotional upside or downside is you. So the upside is phenomenal. Downside is not so great either. So get used to that. Uh, if you don't think that, you know, there are people who've come and told me. Uh, you're not going to be able to eat because of your decisions. Um, you know, it was an emotional boomerang. Obviously, they were going to eat. They were fine. We gave them a two-year severance package and all of that. But these are statements that will be made. So you have to be able to deal with that. At the same time, you do a deal where everybody, you know, we've given six-month bonuses to people. And people will say, you are the greatest CEO we've ever seen. 
You're the best value creator we've not ever seen. So don't get too high on that either. Guess what? You are only a part of that decision. So the high can be super high, the low can be super low. So get used to that. You have to be aware of that even before you get into the role. Finally, a few perspectives from my experience. Always invest where you want to grow. Um, learning is constant. Always be curious. I spent most of my time with advisors, mentors, who had created a strong organizational culture that attracted me. So I always used to say, what can I do to attract that? You know, what can I do to say, we don't need to know what Satya's company is doing. We know he's there to run it. And we want to be part of that vision. Like people who want to join Tesla today, like people want to, or still want to join Apple, any of these companies or Google, etc. One of the things that I found was reading was, it's a meta skill. Uh, you could also do blogs, but there's incredible amount of information available. Look at this forum. Uh, just go back and browse the last five, seven videos, and you will get at least one nugget from each video. That's what I mean. Learning is constant. You always be curious. There's incredible information available out there. Greatest leaders always inspire through their examples. Uh, I've tried to hold myself to the highest standard always. It's not easy. Uh, it's not difficult, but it's not easy. And I, you know, it's a statement that I found, which was very important. Greatness is a series of small steps done regularly to be a better version of yourself. That's all. Just show up, do it, show up, do it, show up, do it. I always ask myself, have I inspired people? Do I inspire others? And if I get an answer as yes, then I feel I'm doing all right. Do not ever accept mediocrity. This is a huge risk, either from yourself, either from others. The day you accept the first mediocre situation is the day you're writing your epitaph. Do not accept it. It's okay. Do it again. Do it again. Do it correctly. Do it again. Do it again. Give them the opportunity to correct. And give them, give yourself the opportunity to be better. But do not accept a mediocre product, mediocre email, a mediocre presentation, a mediocre sales pitch. No. Guess what? It's okay to borrow from the schedules of winners. They did it too. It used to be called copying. Right? You know what's the management term for that now? Best practice sharing. That's called, that's the official word for copy. So it's fine. Winners did it too. Please do it. Uh, one of my favorite quotes. The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. I've seen companies which do semiconductors who want to build hotels. I've seen companies that are technology companies that want to uh, buy electronic stores. I've seen companies who are technology companies want to get into retail. Focus, 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 focus. Do what you're good at and do it better than anybody else. Again, we've got a technical term for fear in management. It's called risk management. It's okay to think bad things. It's okay to be afraid, you create systems, you create controls. You have to lift the back foot, to take the step, right? The fear of failure, I've noticed, is actually greater than the failure itself. We worry more in our thoughts than we actually need to worry about our actions. So be careful. It's okay to think, but don't let fear drive you. Get used to the fact that people are going to dislike you. Many people want everybody to like them. Small tip, it's never ever going to happen. 
your own family members, some of them may not like you. So chances are people you work with may not like you. Your shareholders, not all of them might like you, not all your board members may like you, not all your employees. They're gonna dislike you or even hate you. That's quite fine. Best way to get something is to deserve it first. Okay, deserve the role, deserve the position. You will experience failure. I have experienced failure as a CFO. I have experienced failure as a CEO. If you haven't failed, or at least if you believe you haven't failed, you're absolutely lying to yourself. Uh, most failures come from failure is part failure. You know something is not working. You persist with it. You want to make sure it works beyond a point. Chances are it will fail for sure. And if you don't have any critics, chances are you're doing nothing. You want no critics, easiest to stop, stop working, do nothing. That's fine. What I've benefited from, a mentor. I've had mentors across my journey uh, as a CFO, and most of them are not uh, work. Mentors. More of them are life mentors. They teach you to be strong. They teach you to be resilient. They teach you how to be happy. Uh, they teach you where to look for uh, things that others can't find. And they teach you from their own experiences of what to do and what not to do. Right? Don't be shy to ask someone to be a mentor. You know, chances are you're going to get a no. That's fine. I say no, as you know, I get a lot of mentorship requests. I obviously can't take all of them. But I do take men mentees once in a while. And I feel that that is a nice way of giving back and also taking, uh, continue to be taking mentors in my life when I'm done at this stage. This is, in my view, the most important. You're going to be alone a lot. Okay, so as a CEO, you go and talk to someone. Well, I can do this. I think this, I think it that. The first few weeks or months, the answer that I got is, what problem do you have, dude? You are the CEO already. Why are you worried? They will not get it. They don't understand that you can be at the top and have problems. So you're going to be alone. You have to create a special space where you can go again and again as Superman goes to his fortress of solitude, find your fortress of solitude. It could be multiple things, but it has to be somewhere where you can reflect, where you can think, where you can uh, evaluate. And as you climb the ladder, you'll need this space more and more. Steve Jobs, I think, used to walk around one of the uh, national parks for four hours at a time, five hours at a time, just thinking. You know, everybody has a routine. Be meditation, it be gym, it should be travel. Choose whatever um, makes you reflect well. Choose that. And uh, finally, let's answer this question. Is the CEO role for you? The word I use the most, maybe. So think about it. It's got a lot of benefits. It's got a lot of amazing uh, journeys, but it's also got its fair share of challenges. And uh, I do wish you all the best. And thank you for listening. It's very happy to take questions. Uh, friends, you can uh, probably uh, call out the questions or you can use the chat box as you please. And then we'll uh, have this uh, discussion. So, thank you, Satya. While we wait for the questions, uh, it's fantastic, fantastic insights. Uh, uh, and the last slide being the most important uh, is a C role for you. I believe that is the first question that we need to ask ourselves. And uh, the transition from no to maybe involves a lot. 
a lot of learning, uh, a different role play is what I gather. I'll just wait for the questions. Yeah. Uh, can I say something? I'm Prem Vas. Yeah. Sure. sure yeah, problem. please. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm very proud to have been with Satya. I was his uh, head of HR in the company that he was the CEO. And two things which I was looking forward in this in the presentation, and which represents him is approachability and the ability to listen. Two essential criteria for a CEO. You have to be approachable right from the security guard to the top guy or maybe the nation's head. And uh, you also have to be able to listen. And that's a skill which a lot of us find it difficult to do. Great uh, to uh, uh, hear you, Satya, on this platform. Wonderful. Thank you, Prem. It's very, very sweet of you. Prem was our CHR at Mobby. Um, I have a question. Uh, how did I find my mentors? I actually, um, two or three of them were people that I worked with uh, who were senior to me and who I looked up to who are not necessarily CEOs or even CFOs, but they were managers who had capabilities or qualities which I was very, very enamored with. So I reached out to them to say, how do I build these qualities? How do I understand this? And they are uh, most mentors who want to give back, are very nice about partnering and one of them is still a mentor. He is 83. He lives. He still lives in Connecticut. And um, I'm glad you asked this question. Even today, when I call him once in a while to ask, "What do I do? Uh, what do I think? And what what do you you know? What are the things that I can think about now?" And um, the same answer he's been giving me for 20 plus years. And it's a very powerful answer. He always says, I'm sure you'll figure it out. So it's not him backing away uh, from giving an answer, but it is him telling me that he has the confidence that I will arrive at the decision. And when I tell him, these are the two options that I picked, and these are the things that I think I want to do, and he always says, well, incredible. Both are great ideas, and you know, present it to your board, and go with the one that they feel is good. So this is a mentor who's just gently nudged me for 25 plus years. Uh, he thinks I gave him more credit than it's due, but when somebody tells you at your low point or at a point where you're a little disturbed, I believe in you. I know what you're capable of. It is the most powerful thing that you can hear. That's what a mentor can do for you. That's incredible. Uh, so I found um, that you know work-related mentors were easier to find. But gen in general, you will have people in your life that uh, you look up to. Uh, reach out to them. Uh, I, I, most of the people that I look up to nowadays are people who are, uh, you know, who do not have a need for the rat race, uh, people who have spent more time thinking and reflecting, meditating, I find that they have greater peace and they have greater happiness. So I reach out to them more, but ideally start with somebody at work who inspires you and see if they can be a mentor. So if I could interrupt for one second, we do have a mentoring program at the FENG. Um, I put that in the chat box. Lori Fan is our director of mentoring. And so what she, and there's also a form on the website. So she, and she can talk you through that. Um, so if you write to her um, and you can either be mentored by a fellow FENG member or mentor somebody. So uh, it's in the chat box, Lori Fan mentoring at the thing.org. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte, for that. Uh, I have a question from uh, Sunil. Uh, when you are a CFO, you're very objective. But when you move 
to see you you work with the gray area really how do you train yourself in this transformation is this question uh this is the classic on the job training this is what i meant when jeff bezos said you have to get used to working with incomplete information the first few times that you are uh presented with a gray level situation um i've noticed that i've taken the view that i'm going to distill this into three or four aspects and then take that to uh, two of my board members and like i said my mentor and offer them the situation and the view and then what i think then usually it will start narrowing down to some level of uh, granularity and if you don't get that level of granularity or level of objectiveness that you need uh, be open about it reach out to your uh, board reach out to your mentor or if you're a cfo and you're going through this reach out to your ceo and say listen i'm in this part where a lot of it is gray how can we navigate through this so asking for help is always a good idea but eventually within the second or the third instance you will be able to start forming uh, decision making but it's it's uh, learning by doing in most cases uh, satya i have another question uh, in your slide presentation you had pointed out uh, four key factors uh loyalty passion and two more uh, which uh, i if i find that they are more on uh, more uh, qualities of a leader uh, irrespective of the role uh, uh, the person plays so how to gain advantage uh, of uh, using those because a cfo is uh, maybe already be a leader and then uh, without uh, the emotional intelligence certainly he wouldn't be able to you know kind of uh, inspire and uh, build loyalty uh, and uh, which are kind of uh, non numerical type uh, of uh, uh, qualities or skills so how uh, so that means he is ready if he is able to uh, get to the eq part of it using these qualities or uh, uh, i mean i would like to have that clarity on that uh, please Oh, it's a very, very excellent question. This is not a CEO requirement; it is a leadership requirement. It's absolutely right. Uh, what this does is that you are going from uh, inspiring, uh, creating loyalty, creating trust for a group of people to the entire company. So it's like saying, "I want to play." Um, little league or i want to play baseball in, in san francisco and then i want to play the world series or when in india terms i'm playing gully cricket or regional cricket and now i'm playing i'm the captain of the indian team uh, how does that change obviously the stakes are much bigger the role the quality of decisions are much bigger and the capabilities that you have to inspire because now you're inspiring not just your team but you're inspiring people who are big leaders themselves right so uh, the scale of this scale of that changes i get it i get it. not a, it's not a ceo requirement it's a leadership requirement but right. what it does is it goes from uh, replicating what you did at this level to uh, much much higher level so you yeah. you can't succeed without those great great thank yeah. you uh one more follow on question uh so uh the uh, the no uh trait uh, becomes kind of a buffet for you uh, then uh, generally as a cfo so from the no to the maybe then uh, it means does it mean that you take more uh, hits because uh you have to you know there is nothing uh, they, i mean you are the la you have to take the uh call final call is on you there is no passing on the buck so even for a cfo uh, it may be that uh, uh, i mean uh, end of the day it is not a decision he can only 
uh, put it across, whereas uh, the CEO takes the decision. So you have to take more, you have to be ready for uh, more hits without any uh, protection, probably. Is that uh, a requirement? Yeah, so the, the question that Sunil asked, right? So as a CFO, it's more objective, and as a CEO, it's all gray. Uh, one of the things that I felt I slept better when I was a CFO is that I would say yes or no and go to bed that night because I know somebody above me is going to worry about it. Uh, but when you become the CEO, you're the one worrying about it, right? So uh, the maybe is not um, is not an answer which is a yes or a no. What it means is that every decision of yours needs to be thought out a lot longer because now you have to not only take financial uh, considerations, you have to take operational, you have to take emotional consideration, you have to look at market considerations in case you're a publicly traded company. Um, so, you know, the answer is, yeah, yeah, maybe we can think about that, maybe we can think about this, maybe we can look at it this way. So, it is more about um, keeping the options open as opposed to being ambivalent. It's not about saying, okay, yeah, yeah, let me think and just leave it at that. It's about keeping all options open at all times. And usually what will happen is that if you have a good CFO, uh, which I've had the benefit of, they will say, I think we should do one or two of these. And if you have a good CHRO and a good COO, and if these roles work together well, they will present you two options or three options which they think are best. And then you have the ability to present which one is best for the company to the board or take a decision on that. So it's evaluate maybe not as a negative connotation, but uh, to ensure that you weigh everything in front of you uh, with equal level of insight before you take a decision. I don't find any more questions on the chat box. So I take it that anybody uh, has a question, you can throw it right now. Um, let's maybe give a minute, uh, yeah. Arun, and then we can. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just a uh, fantastic uh, 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 session, uh, Satya. Uh, thank you so much uh, for considering to share with the members of uh, the FENG. Uh, it would be a it has been a privilege to have you here today, despite your busy schedule and agreeing to address our members. And I'm pretty sure that uh, all our members who participated have got some awesome insights into this transition. And I also believe that you would have inspired a few of them to really seriously consider transitioning to a CEO role. So I guess it's been a fantastic evening uh, from you, with you today uh, on behalf of the India chapter and all of the Feng. I thank you. Uh, I look forward to have you again with us on a different topic a few months later. We would love to have you on other aspects of the role of CEO in the functioning in, in relation to the functioning of the CEO. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank, so you. thank you. Thank you. And uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity, Arun. It was nice to see you. Yeah. <laughs> With an absolute uh, uh, like the questions, and I wish all of you the very best. Thank you. So, yeah, can we end the call? I mean, stop. About the upcoming meeting for you to announce. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, can you announce it, Charlotte? I it's on the 23rd of June. Uh, is the next meeting uh, again on the analytical tools, effective use of analytical tools by a very senior 
uh, CFO professional. Uh, so it would be very interesting uh, to uh, you know, learn from his insights. So I request all the members who participated today to register for that event also and uh, encourage us to, uh, which will encourage us to get the most speakers of quality, of similar quality. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, the uh, chairs, uh, co-chairs of other chapters and also past chairs whom I'm not able to mention by name. I look forward to have you uh, with us again uh, in all the forthcoming meetings. Uh, thank you.